I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of the citizens of Muncie, the alumna and the faculty of Ball State Teachers College for the fine cooperation we have had in building this college community auditorium. The citizens of Muncie and the other uh, folks who donated to this auditorium donated in excess of one and one half million dollars. This amount combined with the funds furnished by the college produces one of the finest auditoriums in, East in eastern Indiana. This is another example of the town and gown relationship that exists between the citizens of Muncie and the college. I would like particularly to thank Frank Bernard, who was chairman of the Policy and Planning Committee. I would also like to thank Dick Jennings and Bill Craig, who were executive vice chairman during the campaign. The campaign started in 1960. Things were not too good at that time, and we had difficulty in raising our goal of $1,500,000. We only raised $1,200,000. But in the year of 1963, we again went back to the citizens of Muncie and asked them to complete this job. They came through beautifully, and we raised our total and now are ready to see this new auditorium come into being. For generations to come, they will remember that this combination of the city of Muncie in cooperation with Ball State Teachers College will produce many benefits, lectures, operas, everything that you can conceive of that can be presented on the stage will be available to the citizens of Muncie and to the students of Ball State Teachers College. Again, I would like to thank all those who have so generously given of their time and effort and dollars in making this facility available. <laughs> Gentlemen, what are the policies going to be for outside groups using this auditorium? Well, this committee that you know, the College and Community Committee Advisory Committee, has already drawn up a set of policies. And uh, Earl, you have them, do you not? A copy of the policies that were adopted by the recommended by the committee and adopted by the State Teachers College Board at the last meeting. And those policies are publicized. Um, Earl, have you had them out and the, no, to be publicized? Uh, but they're ready, aren't? They? Any any community organization that's for non-profit, charitable, educational, the like, can have one meeting a year as nearly as we can schedule. Does that help you to? Yes. You have that statement, or perhaps it would be better to read it than for me to try to remember it word for word. Uh, the policy on on use of it would be. Uh, the auditorium will not be leased for any purpose which results in financial gain directly or indirectly to individuals. The auditorium shall be leased only to approved nonprofit organizations located in Delaware County, approved conferences on the Ball State campus, and other groups approved by the Auditorium Advisory Council. With the thinking in mind that the people of the community contributed money for not for people to make financial gain from the auditorium, but rather for organizations uh, to make use of it with lo located within Delaware County. This also excludes professional uh, promoters from other cities coming into the, uh, the community because actually any attraction that's available uh, may be secured by a community organization or by the college itself. Does that help on the Yes. Uh, how many employees will be involved in this, and where are you going to find the technicians to operate all the mechanical equipment? We already have. We have two of them already. And, uh, of course, as the uh, productions come from New York, for example, we get what we call the yellow cards come in, and we need union help, and we determine that from the number that is the cards sent to us. So we we'll have to have more union help naturally as these are indicated. And they will be provided by yes. the union office here. That's right, they'll be provided Monday. by the union office here in Munson. We have are there all enough technicians, out. lighting technicians? Still I think so. So far as we I know. I think so. We good. haven't had any particular problem though, in terms of number yet. Of course, we don't have our major productions, but 
Well, no, the major productions we've had, though, they've had to bring in sometimes into assembly hall as many as eight and ten. So we so haven't had any problems yet. Really, there'll be many more. Can we see the panels? Are they now invisible? Or are they? Can you see behind? Can we get, get behind and see that? Can you get behind them? Well, they're invisible now. Yeah. Yeah. They're see they're behind them. Them. Yeah. You can see the yeah. clock. Uh, I saw them. I'll tell you what they are. They are panels. They're pieces of metal about this wide. And there was a swivel in the middle. And they turn just like a Venetian blind. They're house. vertical Venetian blind. They stand up they like this. Stand up. And, uh, they turn so and they lap here at the edges so that you can get a... What would you say? An eight inch distance between the two panels that stick, the two metal pieces that stick? Eight, eight or nine inches. Eight or nine, so that you actually have a real wide open space to this uh, deadening material or acoustical material behind the panels. And when you close them up, you come right tight. Yeah. And they're behind those blue. Uh, I think we have pictures of the panels. And we took some pictures before we, they were covered. And Dick, the material behind these louvers uh, uh, is absorbing material, extremely absorbent. That's right. Yes. Let, let me tell you another way we tested it, and we frequently do the ingenuity of an architect. We had here two classroom buildings with the, the English and the music, with the uh, TV, radio, the rehearsal areas, and the small theater on the back. All of this to be planned as a unit, finally. So you finally <coughs> came up with a U-shaped space in which you were to place an auditorium. Then, if that weren't enough, we also said that the English building was to be planned in conjunction with English faculty members, the music with English, or with music faculty members, and the auditorium with a combination of both, plus the administration thrown in. Uh, and all of this planning creates a real opportunity or a challenge or a responsibility, whatever you want to say, for checking the ingenuity, challenging the ingenuity of an architect. And this has been one of the real... Uh, wonderful things about working with the Shoalers in these 17 years. When we came, they'd had 17 years of experience at Purdue. Purdue had sent them all over the country. Now they've had, the, is this 34 years of experience you've had? Yes, uh, with, on this kind of, the, so that you do see me, and every one of the buildings is planned in conjunction with the folks who are going to use it. Uh, would that be fair, Bob? You're here. Yes. And this I think I ought to point out something else. This had to be built coming into it only from one side. It had all three sides all already set. And to build this and uh, do what's been done here and get into it only from one side was quite an achievement, really. Thank you for there, that was a re there was a real challenge in communications here, too, in that our friend Kyle Holtz <laughs> speaks only German. And uh, <laughs> this was a real challenge to the architectural firm to understand the technical language that he was passing on to us in the beginning we understood that he was going to communicate to us in English, or he would translate it there and send it to us translated. Instead, it all came German, in German, so we had to impose on some of our friends here to help in translation, and unfortunately, the shoulder organization did have one man, an engineer in your firm, that uh, it was fairly fluent with German, that he could do a uh, reasonable job on that, right, Walter? That is right. This is, has posed quite a, <laughs> quite a problem in the battle of the languages. There are no synonyms for some of them. <laughs> <laughs> one of the things that we spoke about here, the, the uh, moving in from one side, I think we owe a debt of gratitude to this uh, construction firm. They have kept their... Well, you, you look at some of the other buildings that we built and see the number of square feet or the acreage that they've taken in which they've placed materials and equipment. And this group has kept it all between the two fences between these two buildings, and it's been... I don't see how they've done it. You know, there's a thing mentioned in there that uh, hadn't occurred to me, another of the gains, we think about the financial gain of building this U first, but the matter of the outside noise that Earl was mentioning, this is one of the problems, there's probably no auditorium in the country better blanketed from the outside than this one, and now as one of the great gains that came to us, perhaps not thinking of it from that thing first, and I'm thinking of two times that I've uh, known of Leopold Stokowski having a small tantrum, one at Hill Auditorium, a fine place that that is in Ann Arbor, when the taxi whistles penetrated through from outdoors, and finally he stopped on an encore and he said, ladies and gentlemen, perhaps another time when we come, the taxi noises will not be disturbing us. You've been a wonderful audience, but goodbye. <laughs> then, uh, the same thing happened in Houston because they had their two halls back to back, but so much sound transmission, it was a wrestling match, that uh, he, he again had to uh, stop a concert. Well, I can't conceive of that happening here. Uh, 
both from the standpoint of the proper sealing off of sound between the two halls that are back to back, and then from this additional virtue of a, what amounts to a sound blanket enveloping this hall, which you could not afford to build around a normal auditorium. Really, in our work uh, in the past 17 years uh, here on the campus, uh, we have merely uh, tried to interpret and to reflect the requirements that have been posed to us uh, and convert them into uh, architectural drawings uh, from the, the requirements of the, of the various committees and uh, personnel on, on the campus. And I, I don't believe you could say that these are our ideas. They are the college's, the college personnel's ideas reflected uh, in a structure. From the lobby of the College and Community Auditorium of the John R. Emmons College and Community Auditorium, we have with us here Mayor John B. Hampton of Muncie. Good to have you here, John. Do you have a few remarks on the significance of this occasion to the Muncie community? Well, Fred, I've just been able to see the auditorium briefly as I came through a few minutes ago, and uh, I was really amazed. This is an exciting thing for our community, and I think that we can well be proud of the efforts that's going into it. We can be proud of the part the community has paid in, in uh, building this fine auditorium because I don't believe it's surpassed by any I've ever seen. It's a real unique project, they tell me, both from the angle of financing and the way it was built here between these English and music buildings, and it certainly is a lovely thing. You got a good look at it, did you? Well, just a, a brief look. I'm looking forward to the program this afternoon. When you hear, it, when you hear it, I'm sure you'll be pleased. Uh, we understand several dignitaries are coming to Muncie here today for this performance. Yes, I think we've. Uh, there's been invitations sent out to Lieutenant Governor and, and several other state officials, and uh, I'm certain that they're going to uh, 
enjoy themselves very much also. Give them a good welcome. Uh, certainly will. Thanks a lot, Thank John. Uh, Superintendent of Public Instructions, William Wilson, is, uh, is with us here, and uh, he's a man we always have to look up to. It's good to see you, Mr. Wilson. Do you have some uh, comment on this auditorium? You've been associated with it, of course, as a member of the State Teachers College Board. Yes, I am amazed at the wonderful facilities you have here. I think it not only will be wonderful for Ball State and Muncie, but it will be a great asset to the cultural uh, features of this part of the entire part of the state. Certainly it's good to have you here, and we hope you enjoy the concert. Glad Mr. to be Wilson. here, and thank you for inviting me. Yes. Alex M. Bracken is president of the State Teachers College Board. <coughs> Mr. Bracken, it's good to have you here. Uh, any particular remarks? Well, I think, Fred, that this is a certainly a great day for many people, many people who've had dreams of this coming true. And President Emmons, I think, is the one who probably has dreamed the most about this. I think also the wonderful thing about it, Fred, is that, again, we have this cooperation between the community and this college, which, after all, dates back to the very founding of the college. And it's continued through all these years, and I hope it continues in the future. It's a the, real uh, pleasure to be here. The Ball Foundation also played a part in this fundraising campaign. We're happy to have played a part in the chess. Well, it's certainly great to have you here, Alex, you and Mrs. Bracken, and I suppose some other members of the family. Oh, yes, <laughs> there are our family who are here. We Thank want to all. talk to some of the people who are involved in the fundraising campaign. Uh, we see W.F. Craig Sr. here. Bill, you, you were on the coach. Co-vice chairman. Co-vice chairman, I think. It's been so long ago, or I forget exactly what my job was. It has been quite a while ago, and uh, Dr. Emmons will tell us more about that about 25 minutes after 2 from Fine. the stage. But uh, what kind of cooperation did you find in the, in the community aspect of this campaign? As always, the community, more than that their share. I think this is a thing which is typical of Muncie in this community, Delaware County, that when it comes to things worthwhile, they're always there with their hearts, their pocketbooks, their checkbooks. It was a, uh, 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 do you think uh, the results uh, merit the uh, merit the project? Well, you have to see it as you have. Once you do, you can't say anything except that it more than merits the project. About 15,000 people are seeing it this weekend, Fine. and, and uh, we know thousands and thousands more will down through the years. Well, it's good to have you here and enjoy the concert, will you? We uh, want to talk once again. We've uh, had him on the air a couple of times at the press preview and at the, uh, uh, our little lo lobby interviews a while ago. Walter Scholler, Jr., the architect. Mr. Scholler, we'd like for you to say, uh, tell us a little bit about how you feel about this hall now that it's done. Thank you. Uh, it's hard to describe just how uh, we do feel about the job. Uh, we are most pleased as... Uh, I guess you can tell uh, the fact that the hall has turned out uh, good, at least on these first two performances, uh, really makes it worthwhile for all the hours of effort that the design team has put in on the program. You mentioned the design team and the cooperation you've had from them. Of course, John Dedimore from uh, Purdue and uh, Heinrich Holtz from Germany have been here this week. What have been some of their reactions? Yes, I think they're both quite pleased in the, uh, in the results in, in the fields that they're particularly concerned with. And uh, uh, seemingly we are, we are experiencing quite good results in the acoustics and in the stage lighting and sound and uh, stage handling uh, facilities of the auditorium. Stage management. Uh, I know uh, it's been it's going to be quite a job building a staff to handle this. And we we talked a little bit yes. uh, about that yesterday on uh, on your interview. Do you think uh, they have a pretty good nucleus here? Oh yes, quite quite a good uh, nucleus, and they're they're uh, interested in doing a good job, and I I think are doing a, a very fine job. Swell. Well, thank you, Walter Schuler Jr. Thank you. We want to congratulate. Thank you. It's a wonderful wonderful call. Uh, another uh, member of the. Uh, uh, campaign planning committee is a young man for whom we're going to have to lower this. My step in close, Andy, and face the cameras over there. Andy Agalana, uh, what was your role in the campaign, Andy? Uh, I was uh, one of the uh, uh, just little chairman of the divisions, like uh, the labor was at that time. I was the 
uh, president of the AFL-CIO Council. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, we had a major part in the uh, raising of funds of the auditorium. We understand that uh, labor pitched in pretty quickly on this. They uh, were pretty yes. prompt. Yes, uh, uh, they were uh, generously gave and willingly, and uh, uh, I'd say that I'd be uh, satisfied equally that uh, the citizens of Muncie will, uh, uh, when any undertaking that we have, that they uh, will do their part in the activities and the promotion of the uh, well-being of Muncie to be a better place to live in. I know the campaign organization was real thrilled the way you came through, Andy, and uh, uh, I know you're active in a great many other civic affairs, too. We certainly appreciate your being here this afternoon and hope you enjoy the concert. Thank you. Andy Agalana, who was uh, active in the labor phase of this college and community auditorium campaign. We'd like to call uh, a man over here now who had a good deal to do with the finance end of it, J.C. Wagner, vice president and business manager of the college. Good to have you here, Jerry. Thank you, Fred. Uh, would you uh, like to say a few words again to the people about the nature of the financing, how, how this money was raised to build this, about a $3 million project, wasn't it? Yes. Uh, the, uh, first of all, I'd like to say this is a, a great day because it is the, uh, the realization of a dream, and of course it has involved many, many individuals, and the thing that has been most magnificent about it is it's been an entirely a cooperative effort, not only between the college and the people of the community, but it has been a very definite uh, kind of cooperation involving the contractors and the architects and so forth. The financing of the building uh, involved, first of all, a uh, bond issue uh, issued by the college to be paid through student fees for a million four hundred and sixty-five thousand. And then the citizens of the community have raised in excess of a million five hundred thousand. And uh, that's the way in which the building was financed. And uh, we've been very, very happy with the uh, fine uh, uh, cooperation on the part of the people of the, of the city. It's been a marvelous thing. Well, Probably isn't anything like in the country. I think the, uh, the, the community is going to feel that uh, they have a, a right to use this, too, quite a bit. That's right, and uh, we, well, I want to say a word of tribute to the contractors, Hagerman Construction Company and the uh, Hatfield Electric and the uh, Tibbetts uh, uh, organization for a wonderful job of synchronizing because you know, so many people don't realize this was quite difficult to build. Yes, it's right and in between two right. other buildings. That's right, between two buildings and had to be approached only from one side. All materials had That's to come right. from Riverside That's Avenue. That's exactly right, and it's been done very, very well. We're very appreciative of it. Mr. Wagner, congratulations. congratulations. We're going to hear from Dr. Emmons later on. Contributors, friends, it's a very pleasant privilege and a distinct honor for me to say welcome and thank you. We know that you came here today to see this beautiful new auditorium, the College and Community Auditorium, and to see and to hear Fred Waring and his Pennsylvania. So far as we can determine, this is a very interesting first. This is the first time in the history of higher education in the United States that a state institution of higher education and a community have joined together to build an auditorium. Secondly, so far as we can determine, this is a, a first in terms 
of the use of these acoustical panels in the United States. They've been used in foreign countries once or twice, but not here. And then, of course, this is our premium preview for the community. It's an exciting day for all of us here at Ball State. First, it's a real thrill for the college to be able to open this uh, auditorium. Second, we're extremely flattered and pleased with your enthusiastic response to our invitation to be with us for this sneak preview. But more than that, we are deeply grateful and appreciative for the support that you contributors gave when you made possible this community auditorium program. It was your dollars and uh, your labor on committees and your expression of confidence in us and in our plan to provide a joint college and community auditorium that's made this day possible. Plans for an auditorium on the Ball State campus were first discussed as early as 1945. We conveyed our ideas to the campus architect, Walter Scholler and Associates of Lafayette, and as early as 1947, this auditorium appeared, much as it is now, on a drawing of the future campus as we envisioned it. As a matter of fact, I hold here in my hand a report of the president of Ball State Teachers College to the State Teachers College Board in 1947 and pictured in the center of it, you find a campus plan in the center of which is located this building as it now stands and we are in it today, except at that time it faced McKinley. We turned it around and faced Riverside. Following these plans in 1960, a group of Muncie businessmen, some of them alumni of Ball State, offered to conduct a community-wide campaign to raise a million and a half dollars. The Ball State Alumni Association joined this campaign. The community team, headed by Ralph Whitinger, a hard-working, far-sighted general chairman who spent untold hours working with his committee and others in the community, and he was ably assisted by Richard Jennings and William Craig Sr., the co-chairman, and by Frank Bernard, chairman of the Policy and Planning Committee. Of course, it's history now that these men and their committees were successful. So successful, in fact, that the pledges to this auditorium went over the million and one half dollars which was planned for the campaign. Now to this sum, Ball State has added $1,465,000 through a sale of bonds which will be paid off by the students who attend this year and for the next 20 years. I might add at this point that an advisory council composed of individuals from the community and two from the college determine the policies under which the joint college and community project will operate. And a like committee made up of students will set the policy for student utilization of the program. It's uh, impossible for me to tell the story of this hall, but we have every reason to believe that acoustically and in many other ways this will compare favorably with the best in the United States and also the best music halls in Europe. One wishes to pay tribute to some important people. They really were an interesting team. They carried on a highly technical correspondence and conversation in two languages, English and German. I want to recognize and pay tribute to the genius and the vision of our architects, Walter Scholler Sr. and Jr., and their men, to Heinrich Keilholz from Hamburg, Germany, a man with an international reputation in the field of acoustical engineering, and to John Dittemore of Lafayette, our light, sound, projection, and stage consultant. We could say a great deal about the contractors, the Hagerman Construction Company from Fort Wayne with their superintendent, John Meyer, the Hatfield Electric Company, the Tibbetts Heating and Ventilating Company. They've all worked together beautifully. There was an impressive teamwork as they worked with the architects and the consultants and the many, many people whose names I dare not try to start to mention of our own Ball State folks who worked together to make this program possible. I mustn't close without saying that in addition to being thrilled and happy, we are accomplishing our dream, and that you people have been willing to support it. We believe the most overwhelming thing about the audience and about the auditorium is the impact that it will have over a period of years. Each year it will have a tremendous impact on the lives of so many, many people who live in our community and on countless others from surrounding areas who join with us to see opera, ballet, great symphony orchestras, hear noted speakers, choral groups attend conventions, and enjoy this hall in a number of other ways. And also, I am aware of the impact it will have on a continuing stream of students who will attend Ball State in the years ahead. Students who will spend four or five years here, 
And then we'll have contact with other countless individuals, many of them boys and girls and young men and young women, as they leave the college to accept their citizenship roles. This is what we mean by the life stream of an institution of higher education. We can give them, through the programs and the speakers that we bring to this auditorium, new horizons, new ideas, new values. And we wish to thank you for your part in this venture. Mr. Frank Bernard has said it very well, I think, when he said that only an extraordinary romance between town and gown could have brought forth such a beautiful prophecy, an edifice designed to serve well the cultural aspirations not only of us, but of generations yet unborn. Now let me say just a few words about the program that we have chosen for this uh, sneak preview. Fred Waring and his Pennsylvanians. When I graduated from college and started teaching in the outskirts of Detroit well over 40 years ago, uh, Fred Waring's orchestra was the rage. And we went to see and to hear Fred Waring and his Pennsylvanian many times at the Rivera Theater in Detroit. And I have remembered, and some of you may have seen in the paper, but uh, five or six of us one evening gathered up enough courage to go backstage and meet Fred Waring and shake hands with him. I haven't had that privilege since that time until yesterday afternoon here on the platform. I shook hands with him again, and uh, this time they took our pictures. And, uh, and even today they were in the paper. Just imagine. Uh, how, do you, how about that? Well, it is a real pleasure. And I want you to know that uh, we selected Fred Waring and his Pennsylvania because we thought this would be the type of program that the people for their sneak preview would enjoy.